Nate Staniforth, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me on. So you got a book out, Here is Real Magic, A Magician's Search for Wonder in the Modern World. I love this story because I'm a guy, I'm a romantic at heart. Like I love the, you know, the idea of wonder and awe, but also I live in the 21st century, and so it's easy to be cynical and jaded, and you're like, does wonder exist? But you're also looking for it at the same time. So this is your search. Like you're a magician. You're, you're, you're a guy who spends his career inducing wonder in people. But you had this moment where you lost the wonder and you went looking for it again. Before we get there, let's talk about how you became a magician. Because I think this is interesting. How did you get into magic? Because every kid goes through a magic phase. I did. But for some reason, you, you had your magic phase. And you decided, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. How did that happen? Yeah. So just, just to touch on something you said there, you know, long before I knew anything about magic tricks, I, I loved the experience of being amazed and, and of, of feeling that, you know, that sense of wonder or awe or, or, and, and I feel like as a, as a child that comes relatively easy, you know, when you're young, it's easy to be amazed and you notice that as you get older and older, it becomes harder to find. And so, so as a kid, like I remember one night when I was young, my parents took me out to see a meteor shower. And I, I, it was the first time I'd seen the Milky Way, you know, because in the city, the, the city light obscures um, the sky. So all you see, can see is, a, you know, a few stars. But when you go out in the country, it's just, it's staggering if you haven't seen the Milky Way before. It just knocks you down. And, and I remember loving that experience so much, feeling like that was real magic. And then, you know, a few years later when I discovered magic tricks, the the connection that, that I made in my mind was that the experience that you're sharing with an audience with a good piece of magic is the same thing as you're getting from the night sky or a sunrise or a sunset. And so, you know, from the beginning, I, that's that was my interest in magic, using, using the, the craft of the magician to share that experience of wonder with people. And how did you discover magic? Did you like, you were one of those kids who watched David Copperfield on TV and you're like, I'm going to walk through the Great Wall of China like that guy? What happened? Yeah, that, that came later. For me, it was an accident. I ended up uh, reading The Lord of the Rings. You, you know, those movies came out uh, when I was a little bit older, but when I was young, it was just the books. And, and I wanted to be able to cast spells the way that Gandalf the Wizard did in the book. And so I ended up, you know, going to the library, looking for a book of actual magic that I could do for people <laughs> on the playground. And it turns out that's not how it works, but, but I learned how to make a coin disappear. And, and that was pretty good. No, I remember like thinking like the awe, you know, when I went through my magic phase, I went, you know, checked out all the books in the library about magic tricks. And I remember when I learned how to do the French drop, is that what it's called? Sure. Yeah. With the, the coin, we make a coin disappear. And I looked in the mirror and like the first time I did it and it looked like it disappeared, like I blew my mind. Yeah, the the thing you learn as a magician, like the the astonishing thing from the magician side of of the performance, is how little it takes to take a grown, educated adult and make them believe in magic for a moment. You know, I remember I, I, my first piece of magic was very similar. It was a coin vanish, and I did it for for the children at school just at recess. We were playing football, and then I decided to make this coin disappear and. And, you know, the kids saw it and they didn't know I was a magician. They didn't know that was, they were seeing a trick. So they just saw this coin disappear and they started, you know, they sort of started like screaming and jumping and running around. So the teacher on duty at the playground, I was terrified of this woman. She stormed over and demanded that I show her whatever I showed the kids to make them you know, scream and run away. So I made the coin disappear for her as well. And, and this was not a lady that you ever messed around with. She was terrifying. And, and I, I remember my hands were shaking when I did this trick for her. But when I opened my hand and showed her the coin was gone and I looked up, it was like the, the transformation was total. She, she was no longer this, you know, this authoritarian dictatorial teacher uh, presence on the playground. It was like she was a little kid again. And, and that, far more than the secret to the trick blew me away you know that that you could use anything and and take someone through that transformation that that felt incredible to me it's like what do you think what do you think is going on there why why do we feel wonder like is it just like the mystery that we don't know is it i mean what do you think is going on there yeah i mean i think it's i think it's a lot of things going on but but i think especially for adults you know 
and, and, and I say this as an observation of my own experience as much as you know, seeing the, the people around me, but I know that in my life, I'm very good at making things ordinary. You know, uh, humans are really good at getting used to things. And, and when I think about my favorite moments, it, it, it is, it's those moments that have, that have pulled me out of that sense of the ordinary. And, and magic is so good at doing that because it takes something that you think you know and turns it on its head right away. It's almost like skydiving. You know, I think that, I don't know if you've been skydiving before, but, but it is a total violation of everything you think you know about <laughs> how you should behave, you know, because they open the airplane door and you jump out and it's just that, that is such a, you, you don't do that. that. You have to be crazy to do that. But, but when you make that jump, there's this sense of freedom and release and and that's how good magic feels as well. What's the career path like to becoming a professional magician? Because that's something I have no like. I mean, if I were like if my kid said I want to become a magician, I would I would have no clue to tell them like, well, here's your next step. So what does that look like? Yeah, well, and you know, I grew up in Iowa, um, and and no one from Iowa grows up to become a professional magician. You know, I think maybe if you grew up in New York or Las Vegas or Los Angeles, where there are other professional magicians, you could you could see someone else and try to copy their career path. But but for me, that that just wasn't the case. So I think you know, I think I, I my in my experience, I just had to make it up as I went. And uh, you know, in in my town, I grew up in Ames, Iowa, and. There was this, there was this athlete. He was in middle school when I was a kid and then he went to high school and he was a, a phenomenal basketball player. And, you know, the whole town would go out to watch him play. And then he got signed on to the local college team and then he made it to the NBA. And then he was, he's the, the head coach of the Bulls now, Fred Hoiberg. But, but growing up and seeing this guy rise from a, a small town in Iowa to, you know, national superstardom. That was, it was an incredible thing to see because it made me realize that even as a, a young magician, like it's, it, it's okay to have an unusual job. It's okay to do something that not everyone else is doing. You know, I thought if he could make it to the NBA, maybe I could make it as a magician. So I just started doing shows everywhere. I did them for birthday parties and Cub Scout banquets and you know, the advantage I had is that I was the only act in town. Uh, if you wanted to hire a magician for your children's birthday party, I, I was even at age 11, I was the only option. And so, you know, I just, I, I got in a great deal of experience, even by the time I finished high school, that, that allowed me to make the, the jump to becoming a professional, I think a little, a, a little more intuitive. It didn't seem like as big of a jump because I'd already had so much flight time. Did you go to college? I did, yeah. But I, I, I went because I got an acting scholarship and I thought maybe I could learn something about becoming a great magician by studying stagecraft and, and dramatics. But in the end, the best way to learn how to do magic for people is just to do magic for people. Do magic for people. I mean, and what, I mean, I imagine it's just you're on the road a lot, right? It's just like constantly touring, correct? Yeah, it, it is. You, you know, I think I had this vision of having there be some point where you make it, where you feel like you've arrived and, and, you know, finally you're on tour. And, and that lasted for about a week. And <laughs> after that, I was just faced with the relentless reality of traveling, you know, a hundred days a year, 150 days a year, 200 days a year. And, uh, and, and, you know, there's a very small window of my day where I do the show and the rest of my day was just dedicated to getting from one place to another. One place. So it's a grind. I mean, and also, I mean, here's another thing like about magicians and performers, particularly magicians, like they give off this aura of mystery. You know, they make everything look effortless and easy. But, you know, we did this post on uh, Harry Houdini and sort of his work ethic a couple of years ago and, you know, researching it. Like I was blown away about how disciplined and how much willpower and how much of a hard worker this guy was. Like it was it was just, it was mind blowing. It was a grind. I mean, do you, did you take that sort of workman like approach to your magic as well? Yeah. Houdini was my hero growing up. And, and I think for a lot of people, you know, there's no, here's the thing about magic. There's no practical reason to be a magician. If you want to be famous, there are far better ways to become famous. If you want to be rich, there are far better ways to become rich. So you only do magic if you love it. And, and, you know, some of the most hardworking people I know are magicians because 
it, it, it just takes an extraordinary amount of work, not only to perform the shows and to go on tour, but to develop the material and to teach yourselves the skills that you need. So, so yeah, I mean, Houdini sort of set the example for everyone. Uh, there's a quote of his that I have on my studio wall. He says, the real secret to my success is simple. I work from seven in the morning to midnight and I like it. And, uh, you know, I, I hit Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. You know, you've read that uh, to become a master at anything, you have to hit 10,000 hours. I hit that when I was 22. And, you know, I think that's true for most magicians who, who are serious about it. It just, it takes a lot of time and a lot of work. Right. So this is kind of interesting quote. I mean, that kind of raises the question, is magic like an art or is it more of a craft like plumbing or carpentry? I, I, it's both. And I think, I think the reason I love it, or one of the reasons I love it as a prof- profession is it, it, it's both. It's sort of like building a cathedral. You know, first you need to have this grand aesthetic vision and this, this, you know, this wonderful dream of how it will look when it's done. You need that. Otherwise, you know, you'll never build anything, but then you also have to become a bricklayer and actually start to make it and, uh, and finish it. And, you know, so I think, I think I'm similar to many other magicians in that the day is divided in two, where every day I have a series of things that I have to practice just to keep my skills up. But then you also have to look at, you know, the long term, what what am I trying to build? What am I trying to create? How do I want this to feel? And that allows you to, you know, create things on stage for people that, that really feel amazing. And you also, during this time when you were touring, you started getting touring, you got a girlfriend, you even get, got married. Like, what did your girlfriend think, or now wife, think was like, you said, I'm a professional magician. <laughs> yeah. Like, you was know, she, she like, is, is this I, going anywhere or what's, what's <laughs> happening? Uh, we met uh, while I was still in school. She was in school as well. And, and before I had made the jump to becoming a professional. So I think we both, you know, knew what we were getting into a little bit, but it, it is, it is unusual. You know, that first year I was on the road all the time and, um, it, it's certainly hard being away from home so often. I will say though that, you know, I think it's important to keep it in perspective. Going on tour is hard, but it's not like fighting in Afghanistan. You know, it's not like there are many couples who have it, have it much harder than we did. And so, yes, it's hard to be apart, but, um, you, you know, it, I, I don't want to whine about it because right. you know, we both signed up for it and, uh, uh, you know, it turned out all right. All right. So you started, you became a magician because you loved that feeling of wonder, awe that you experienced when you did a trick where you saw the look on other people's face where they were just like blown away and their minds blown. Got in it for that reason. You hit the road, you reached a point where you lost it. Tell us about that moment when you finally realized, like, I just don't feel the magic anymore in magic. Well, so, so let me say this first. I think most professions have this problem where they, you know, on the outside, it looks glamorous and it looks wonderful and exciting. And, and that sort of glittering veneer conceals a grinding day-to-day reality within. You know, I, I don't know anything about being an architect. I think on the outside, being an architect looks amazing, but I'm sure there are probably vast swaths of the job that are tedious and and you know very much a grind and and the same is true for being a magician you know we've already spoken about the the rigors of travel and and the amount of practice time that it takes but i i i found you know i i as soon as i graduated from college i jumped into the world of touring as a magician and after 5 years i was just burnt out i i i had thrown myself at this i had dedicated my entire life to this and i was just i was tired and and it didn't you know for for someone whose job depends on being able to share that experience of wonder none of it felt very amazing at all and and there was one night when i was on stage in milwaukee and I, you know, I had been on the road for, for a, a long time. And in the middle of the show, I just stopped and I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm done. I'm, uh, I'm going to go. Good night. And I went back to my hotel room, not knowing what to do because I, I, I felt like whatever ship I was on was sinking and I needed to figure something else out. Yeah. I mean, I do think that that's why I, I love this book because I think that happens, like you said, it happens to everybody. Uh, you know, they get a profession or they start this thing that they love, but then it just, they lose 
lose the spark and it becomes a grind. But what's compelling about your story is that your whole job is to convey magic, right? Convey yeah. that feeling and you lost it too, you know? Yeah, that's right. You know, when when you lose that spark in another profession, you can you know, maybe fall back on the craft or, or even just feeling like you're, you're doing something useful for, for the world. But as a magician, when you lose that, that sense of, of, um, that spark or that, you know, that sense of wonder about the work, that's the very heart of the profession that, that you lose. And so I felt like I was such a phony on stage because I was trying to give people this experience that, that I couldn't feel at all. And, you know, a, a magician has to believe in the magic on some level or, or it doesn't feel like magic. You know, it just feels like a trick. Nobody likes being tricked. Nobody likes being deceived. But, but a great magician can, can use that craft of deception to give you something real, sort of like fiction, right? Like a, a good novelist can, can make up the entire story. You know, magic is fake in the same way that a novel is fake, but that doesn't matter. You're, you're using it to give give the audience something real. But, but as a magician, when you become disconnected from that, that sense of wonder, the whole thing just falls apart. Did this, has this ever happened to other magicians? Like, did this happen to Houdini, for example? Did he get jaded about the profession? He did. You know, most people, most people don't know this about Houdini, but, but he spent the last, I don't know, third of his career trying to get out of the magic business. And you can read his letters and he talks about the rigors of being on the road and how exhausted he is. And, and, you know, he, he tried to get into the movie business. Uh, He started the Houdini Motion Picture Corporation because he wanted, he wanted to find another way to work. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think it is, I mean, I, you know, as we said, I think it's a liability in any job, but, but it's especially true for the magician because, because of the, uh, the importance of, of, uh, wonder and, and, you know, feeling that when you're, when you're trying to give it to the audience. So, I mean, what did you tell your wife when you said, uh, you know, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And yeah, you know, well, she, I mean, she, she, she had been part of the process the whole time you know, talking while I'm on the road and you call home. And, and then when I'm home, you know, it, at first I was thrilled to go out on tour and, and then I was ambivalent about it. And then I, I dreaded it. And I, you know, it was like a, like a death sentence, you know, <laughs> watching that date come closer and closer on the calendar. And, and I think, you know, I think she wanted me to figure it, figure it out too, because no one wants to live with someone who's just miserable about their work all the time. So, so she was totally on board with me finding a way to, to sort of dream it all up again and, and find a new way to approach my craft. But, um, but, but yeah, it, I, I, I certainly didn't know what to do. Right. Well, the one thing you came up with, which out of the blue is like, I'm going to go to India. <laughs> well, right. And the, and the land of mystery, like, what, <laughs> where did, where did, you know, sometimes it, honestly, it was a coincidence. Like sometimes the universe is just an amazing place and incredible things happen on their own uh, on you know, on tour, there's plenty of time to read because you get sick of playing games on your phone very quickly. And so I, you know, I just read a lot when I was on the road in the hotel or on the airport or in the airplane or backstage after a show or before a show. And, and on the leg of the tour where I quit in the middle of the show, I just happened to be reading this. It was an academic text about traditional Indian street magic. And so when I left the theater and went back to my hotel, I, you know, I was laying on the bed in like the super eight or whatever it was reading this book about traditional Indian street magic. And it, it, the whole thing started as this crazy idea. Like what, what if I leave this whole world of touring in America behind and forget everything I know about being a professional magician and travel to the other side of the world and, and try to dream it all up again. You know, the, the mission statement at the beginning was how can I put myself back into the, the mindset of being in the audience? You know, maybe I could go because India, India has this tradition of magic that's famous in the world of magician. So I wanted to go see snake charmers and fire breathers and street performers and, and see anything that would amaze me to try and rediscover why I liked magic in the first place. I mean, the one trick that you described that sounded brutal, but I never knew it existed was like this, like is it the resurrection trick that happens in India? It's like, it has a few different names. Yeah. But, but it's, I mean, the thing, the thing you have to understand about the magic that I saw over there is that it's 3000 years old. There's a, a, a tradition of magic that stretches back for 3000 years with the secrets passed from, you know, the parents to their children and then over and over and over again. And, 
you know, to be fair, some of those illusions look like they're 3,000 years old. And when, when I saw them, you know, with modern eyes, sort of looking with all of the experience I had as a magician, some of it wasn't amazing at all. But there were a few pieces that were just staggeringly good. And yeah, one of them is where you, you know, so that usually the magician works with his son. It's a, a, com- a combination act where the son is the assistant. But I, I saw... I mean, it was brutal. The father took a um, a sword and seemingly butchered, you know, his child. And there's this boy who's bleeding, and then he covers, just lying on the ground, and he covers him with a sheet and brings him back to life. And you can imagine how, you know, two thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, if you saw that in a village, it would just feel like a miracle. Well, in like, what is the tradition of magic in India? So, like, it's it's old. Um... And they're performing like these street tricks, like the the the, the cobra stuff, the the rope. I, mean, I guess that really didn't happen. You talk about in the book, but this thing, yeah, yeah, the rope trick is a hoax, right? But but let me say this: so every culture in the world has its own culture and tradition of magic. It's just like food or theater or music, right? Magic is a cultural expression um, as as much as the other art forms, and so uh, you know, magic in one culture would look different than magic in another culture. Um, in, in India, there's this tradition of these nomadic tribes of street performers that would travel around the country performing from village to village. And, and you know, so much of their, their material reflects the challenges of living in a place like India where it's hot and, um, you know, sometimes you're faced with extreme poverty or, or, you know, lack of nutrition. So, so like a, 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 a an illusion they performed is they show a basket that's empty and they cover it with a cloth and they open it up and it's filled with food and they pass all the food around and they show a bowl that's empty and totally empty and they cover it with cloth and it's filled with water and everyone can have something to drink. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very far removed from the world of card tricks that, you know, sprung up in, in Europe, but I thought it was fascinating. And, and, uh, you know, I went there looking for those illusions, but what I found very quickly was that, you know, and I found them and they were great, but, but even more amazing than the magic that I saw was the culture of India and the people of India and the experience of traveling in a place that was so different from my own country and my own culture. You know, I was totally out of my element and, uh, and as a result, I couldn't fall back on any of the sort of, uh, I don't know, patterns or, or behaviors that, you know, you normally use in your own culture. Everything was new and uh, everything was uh, different. And I, I felt like I had to pay attention and I was alert and awake. And, uh, and, and that, more than the magic I saw, was, was unbelievably wonderful. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, I mean, wonder is experiencing something new. So by putting yourself in a completely foreign situation, you're more likely to experience that. Yeah. I mean, it's like what we were speaking about earlier, how if it's true that as adults, we, we become very good at making things ordinary, then one of the ways you can break yourself out of that is by plunging yourself into an environment where nothing is ordinary. And, and you know, as a result, you're, you're not living from moment to moment on your certainties but instead on your instincts and your observations and, and uh, you know, magic and travel are very similar and that they both uh, can deliver this cataclysmic death blow to, to your sense of certainty about the world and your place in the world. And so rather than living in the story that you tell yourself about the world all the time, you're just living in the world itself. And that, that is amazing. What I thought was interesting is, you know, you, India has this reputation of being this land of mystery and wonder but when you got there, like you found that, I think you talk about, you described how people in India were actually pretty ambivalent about that reputation. And in fact, they, they try to be like, they go out of the way. It's like, no, we're scientific. We don't believe in that stuff. Those are just tricks. What do you think is going on there? Yeah. I mean, I think that the image of India as a land of mystery is antiquated and, you know, outdated and has its roots in a lot of sort of questionable colonial uh, practices from from so long ago you know it it was it was easy for the european powers to um embrace rationalism and science in their own culture and and to say that anyone who didn't live like that 
you know, must live in a land of mystery. But India is a modern superpower. And, and, you know, the people I met were, were, were quick to assure me that the reputation of India as a land of mystery is just a fabrication. And, uh, and, you know, some of them loved seeing magic and some of them didn't just like, just like in America, just like in the United Kingdom. You know, I want to be clear that I didn't go to India because I thought that it was a land of mystery. I went because I wanted to find those people who were performing the illusions that I was reading about in the book. And, you know, I could have gone anywhere. If I was reading a book about J- traditional Japanese magic, I would have gone to Japan or China. I, I just got lucky and, and went to India. And like, what did these street magicians, you know, that have the tradition that goes back thousands of years. When you told them, like, I too am a magician, like, what did, what, how did they receive you? Well, so let me, let me set the stage just a little bit. At the end of the book that I was reading, there was this lengthy interaction with, with one of the tribes of traveling street magicians that has settled in a slum outside New Delhi called Shada Pradipo. And, and when I finished the book and decided that I was going to go to India, I wrote the, the author of the book an email and said, listen, I'm going over there. Are you still in touch with any of these people? And could you facilitate an introduction? And that worked out. So, so on my trip, I knew that I had to be on a particular corner at a particular day at a particular time. And one, you know, the leader of this tribe would, would take me in and, and talk to me about his, his illusions. And I get to see all the stuff that I read about, you know, I, I had never been in a slum before and I, it was just, it was unlike anything I've ever, ever experienced. It was like, you know, you look at those pictures of Dresden that was bombed in World War II. And that's the closest thing that I can, it was just rubble and garbage and tarps, you know, forming houses. And, and in this wasteland of an environment, I discovered one of the most kind, welcoming families you could possibly imagine. When they discovered that I was a magician and I wanted to talk with them about magic, they welcomed, welcomed me into their home. Like I was a long lost member of their family. And, and, you know, I thought I was just going to speak for an hour and I spent the whole day with them and they cooked this enormous feast and, and showed me all of the magic that, that I wanted to see. And they also wanted to see the magic that I did. Some of the pieces in my show have their roots in, in that traditional Indian magic. And so it was, it was incredible for me to be able to show them my version and they could, they could show me theirs. And, you know, we, we had nothing in common. I, I'm a magician from Iowa and, and they live in a slum outside New Delhi. So we had nothing in common but magic, but, but that was enough. No, as you described that, you know, they're, they're living in the slum, but yet they're able to make a life for themselves, right? I mean, it's, that's magic. It's like, that's like alchemy, right? You're turning lead into gold. That's, that's exactly it. It, it felt like an actual miracle. And, and I'll tell you what's even more amazing. The, the leader of that tribe works as a magician in India. He performs at parties. He performs you know, wherever he can. He just hustles for a living. He, he hustles like you would not believe. And he saved enough money to wire his home in the middle of the slum with internet access so that he could, using the internet, and a, a computer that he was able to afford after just saving up after show after show after show, uh, so so his children could learn online and you know hopefully hopefully have a better life and and uh, that w- when I saw that and I I understood just from speaking him from to to him what what he had to do to make that possible, like how many people see that slum and and just dismiss it you know as 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 um, you know, like I said, a wasteland, not knowing that inside there's this family who are making this incredible life for themselves and for their children. It was, I I was there, you know, almost a decade ago. And I think about that every day. It was just remarkable. So was it, was it the, the, so the experience in the totality or was there like a moment where you saw a, a, an illusion and you're like, you had, you were, wow. I mean, was, I mean, or it, was, was it both? both. Like yeah. I, you know, I, I, in the book, I, I talk about some of the illusions that they showed me, but, but, even, and, and they were remarkable. And, and there's one in particular, I saw this version, their version of the fire breathing illusion that I, I still can't explain to this day, but far more amazing than any of the magic I saw were the people themselves, how in this incredibly tough, I mean, just uh, unbelievably tough. I'd never seen anything like it that they were able to 
create this life for themselves and treat, you know, I, I, I guess I didn't know what to expect. And, and the reality that I discovered blew me away. And uh, that was far more amazing than any of the magic that I saw. So, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to other people who've had this similar experience, you know, they weren't a magician, but they, they somehow got disenchanted with life. And so they go on this like trip or a journey and they experience that transformative moment where they rediscover wonder again. Now, the hard part, it seems, is like, how do you bring that back with you to your ordinary world, right? You had that feeling in India, but like at some point you had to return to Ames, Iowa. So how, how did you take that back with you? Yeah, it's one thing to be amazed on the other side of the world when you're living out of a backpack traveling through the foothills of the Himalayan mountains. It's another thing, as you say, to bring it back to Iowa. You know, I... I think that's probably that's probably the the main idea that I came home with that you know I went to India to rediscover the sense of wonder but you don't have to go to India it you, you can find that that same spark that I was looking for anywhere you can find it in music or movies or basketball or poetry or mountaintops or sunrises or sunsets right it's more about it's more about how you look than where you look and even more than that, it's about remembering to look. You know, I know in my own experience how easy it is to disappear into the, the to-do list of every day and to break every day into nothing more than a list of things that I want to work and do and accomplish, and that's it. And, and you know, you can, you can lose a day or a week or a month or a year or a lifetime without ever pulling your head out of that machine and looking around. And, and, and the idea that I came home with was if you stop and try to find that sense of, of, of wonder and awe, wherever you are, you will find it. You just have to remember to look for it. There's that, there's that Joseph Campbell quote, and I'm going to butcher this, but he, he said something like people talk about searching for the meaning of life but what they're actually looking for is is the rapturous joy of feeling alive and when i think back on my my time in india and also just on, on, on my experience as a human being my favorite moments aren't aren't my victories you know the moments where i feel like i've su- succeeded at something they're the moments where i feel like i'm most awake and alert and alive and y- you know people find that in all sorts of ways but but for me, the single greatest distinction between having that in my life and not having that in my life is, is the daily practice of looking for it. If you look for it, you'll find it. It's just you have to remember to look. Where do you look on a day-to-day basis? Well, so, so many places. You know, I, I think travel is still a very good way of doing that. But um, you know, I've, I have uh, two young children now, and the youngest, who's three, has this this routine that he does every night before bed, he insists on going out to say goodnight to the stars. And it sounds like, (laughs) it sounds like, uh, it sounds sort of ridiculous. You know, it sounds like a cliche until you try it. And, and then it doesn't sound like a cliche anymore. Then it doesn't feel like a cliche every night when we go outside and just, you make two minutes before going to bed, you just carve out two minutes to go up and look outside and remember that it goes on forever above you and forever below you and forever all around. And that somehow you are here to be a part of this. That has, you know, that has influenced me as much as going to India. Anyway, I'm grateful to him for wanting to do that because when it's cold, when it's late, when I'm tired, I don't want to do that. But, but having him insist on going out to say goodnight to the stars has been very good for me, certainly. Yeah, having kids definitely can help you find the one because they're, they're looking for, they can see it, right? Yeah, you know, and they can see it. And I, I remember when I was a young kid, you know, as a young magician, you see, you see, here's what happens. As, as a kid, you see how your adults, the adults in your life act all of the time, teachers, parents, grandparents, neighbors. But, but the young magician gets this sort of window into a different side of the adults in your life. Because when you show them a piece of magic, they, for a second, they're not adults anymore. You get to see this glimpse of how they were when they were kids. You know, I talked about that teacher on the playground when I made the coin disappear, but I saw that hundreds of times. And, 
And it makes you realize as a young kid looking forward, it, you know, towards adulthood that you lose something when you become an adult. And, and my interest in magic was, was as, you know, as much in that as anything, what do you lose? What, what have these people lost? What happened to you? And how can, how can you get it back? How, how's your career as a magician looking like now? You know, I, I just had this book come out. And so writing a book is, it's a all encompassing experience in a way that I did not expect. At first I was you know, writing while I was on tour and I'd, I'd go back to the hotel room afterwards and write for an hour. And then again, when I woke up the next morning before the flight, but, uh, to finish the book, I stopped touring and just finished, you know, just, just wrote. And, uh, when the book came out in January, I I went back on the road again and and I'm about to start my fall tour. And so, you know, it's, I'm in this strange spot right now where I write books and I tour as a magician and, uh, you know, I'm making it up as I go, but, but I love it. And I feel very lucky that I get to do all of this. You feel like you the magic's back in your magic? It is, yeah. I, I feel like after having finished the book, I can see the magic in a way that I couldn't see it before. I, I know what I'm shooting for, and I think I know how to hit it. Well, Nate, is there some place people go to learn more about your work? Um, you know, I think the I think the best place is just the book. I, I put everything that I have to say about magic and and wonder and disillusionment and and rediscovering wonder in your daily life. You know, all of that is in the book. So if you're interested, it's called Here Is Real Magic. You can find it on Amazon or at any bookstore. And anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Nate Stanforth, thanks for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. My guest today was Nate Staniforth. He's the author of the book, Here is Real Magic. You can find out more information about his work at natestaniforth.com. You can find the book on amazon.com. And also check out our show notes at aom.is slash realmagic, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.